All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Kendra Sakamoto, and I'm one of the librarians here at West Vancouver Memorial Library. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I am joining you today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish Nation, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and the Musqueam Nation. Uh, the Coast Salish peoples have been the careful caretakers of these lands and waters since time immemorial. Um, I personally am extremely grateful to live and to garden in this beautiful place. I strive to walk respectfully in the footsteps of all of those who have come before me. Um, and this is particularly true when I'm gardening and working with the land. So when you're out working in your gardens and you know, you've got your hand in the soil, just take a moment to remember the people who have really stewarded these lands forever. Um, today, I am very delighted to welcome David Katzel for our final Garden Talk Lecture of the Spring. Um, David was a farmer for 20 years before taking on the role of the BC Seed Security Program Manager for Farm Folk City Folk. He's delivered countless workshops across the Lower Mainland and has a special passion for sharing seed stewardship knowledge with people of all ages. Uh, welcome, David. Thank you. Um... Yeah, thanks so much. I think I'll just, uh, I'm going to jump in in a second and get started. Um, but I was just, I'm, I'm always curious to hear, see who's in the room. And unfortunately, I can't see you through this medium, um, but I can see you in the chat. So um, what I'm curious to know as I move through this presentation is if you're here with specific questions, I'd love to hear them right off the bat so I can think of them while I'm uh, presenting uh, about seed saving. If there's specifically, if there's a variety of vegetable that you're interested in saving seed from, or you have in the past, or you have questions about, um, I'd love to hear that. Um, otherwise, I'm going to share my screen and jump into um, this presentation. That's a, it's a seed saving presentation, but it really is about increasing um, your your garden ecosystem and your 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 garden community um, by incorporating. Uh, seeds into your into your landscape. Okay, great. So, um, so yeah, this is a seed saving workshop. Um, I've presented a, a few times, um, and I'm going to think sort of specifically about us um, again increasing um, the, our whole garden landscape in terms of uh, biodiversity and community when we introduce seeds. Um, I really appreciate your um, your land acknowledgement. And I just wanted to do um, a similar type of seed acknowledgement as well. Um, it's true, when we're in our gardens, we we definitely need to think about the land that has been uh, stewarded for so many years. Uh, myself as a seed saver and somebody who practices um, a certain type of agriculture, um, I'm, I'm very aware that the landscape that I live in is a food system. Uh, we think of it as wilderness, but I the, the people who steward this land looked after the wilderness as a food system. Um, the Fraser River all the way up from northern BC down to the down to the ocean is um, a very extensive aquaculture system. Uh, along the banks there was um, there were animals, there was root gardens, um, and there was it was a very different type of agriculture. And so Often when I'm saving these seeds, I'm, I'm, I have to acknowledge and realize that what I'm practicing here is quite different. Um, that said, Indigenous people have been actually the backbone of uh, the type of agriculture that I've practiced for 20 years as well, probably for the last uh, uh, five to 300 years in this country. Um, and they used to do a lot of that type of agriculture, um, unfortunately have been um, moved off of that land in the sort of mid 1900s and back to reserves and uh, modern agriculture has just uh, continued to become a bit more industrialized. So um, just acknowledging that these seeds um, as well, seeds are something that we steward, that we share, it, we share and we save them, but they are also saving us. We wouldn't be alive without them and they wouldn't be alive without us. So they really are, it's a mutually beneficial relationship that we have with our seeds and our seed ancestors. Um, so as mentioned, I, I, I did farm for about 20 years. Uh, we did a lot of mixed vegetable farming. Uh, seeds have always been part of what I've grown. I came into farming actually through uh, 
garden education, working with an, a, a group in Vancouver called the Environmental Youth Alliance that is still active today. Um, I used to run a youth garden uh, in the, near the downtown east side, um, and that's how I came into to farming. Um, I now work with Farm Folk City Folk, um, who is the uh, one of the oldest and largest food and agriculture charitable nonprofit organizations in BC uh, that started in 1993. Um, I, our overarching mission is to connect, empower, and inspire people to strengthen our sustainable food systems. And the BC Seed Security Program, um, which has many programs we run under it, uh, support both farmers and home gardeners and gardening groups um, to build a resilient seed supply. Because without a sustainable and resilient seed system, you don't really have a sustainable and resilient food system. So I'm going to talk a bit about the importance of um, saving seed. And so I'll just paint a picture for you that, um, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago, a couple hundred years ago, not that long ago, um, I'd say 200, every farmer used to grow seeds. Uh, agriculture started somewhere around 12,000 years ago. Um, and it's only really been the last 150, 200 years that seed saving has sort of fallen into fewer and fewer hands and become more specialized. So if you imagine that every farmer and every gardener used to produce some of their own broccoli seed, um, the diversity of broccoli that would be available out there is huge. Um, whereas when you get one company producing all the broccoli seed for all the farmers across the country, um, they're not able to maintain uh, hundreds or thousands of different varieties. So they need to uh, reduce those. And uh, when seeds become commodified, um, the the best way to make your most amount of money selling seeds is actually to sell one variety of seeds and lots of it, not a huge number of different types of varieties of seeds. So as well as that, uh, companies have maintained more and more control of the global seed market. Um, this is probably an old quote, the top 10 seed and chemical companies control 67% of global seed market. Um, that's probably changed. It's more like probably 75% nowadays. Um, there's definitely an increase in patenting and barriers to saving seeds, um, and this has led to just a lot of commercialization and consolidation and ultimately just control of seeds by fewer people. Um, and so some of that is a little depressing, but I have good news for you too. Um, so th this, is a, this is an old graphic. I have a, a number of old graphics here. Um, but what this shows, this shows the uh, decline in uh, varieties over um, sort of from the uh, early 1900s to the 1980s. Um, so what I'd like to point out, though, if you take tomatoes as an example, you know, it says here in the 1900s, if you look through seed catalogs or seed companies, you could find 400 and something varieties of tomatoes. Today, there's maybe commercially uh, available 80 varieties. Uh, I don't know if these numbers are true. They may have changed a fair bit. But what I would say is those 80 varieties, half of those are probably varieties that have been released for the um, greenhouse or sort of industrial farming industry and aren't even really suitable for backyard gardeners. So even less of those are suitable for backyard gardeners. Um, However, like the the uh, the hopeful story here is I was just looking through some old uh, news articles and in 2015, the Creston Community Seed Bank, which is uh, out in, in the, the Kootenays in British Columbia, they had a collection of over 800 different varieties of tomatoes that they do donated to Seeds of Diversity Canada. Um, if you open up Seeds of Diversity Canada's catalog, and this is a, a member-driven organization their backyard seed savers that have been saving, you know, these heirloom and old varieties for years. There's well over 300 to 400 different varieties of tomatoes you can find. Uh, these aren't commercialized, so they don't fall into the, you know, commercialized seed world. They're held under people's beds and in their backyards and in their seed libraries. Um, but there's a lot of diversity still out there in backyards, um, not so much maybe in the commodified seed world. 
And as well, this is, again, this is an old uh, graphic from 2012. Uh, this has changed since. This is the market share of seeds. And again, keep in mind, this is like the, the world of the commodification of seeds. These aren't the seeds that we have um, under our beds or in, in seed libraries. Uh, since this graphic has been you know, produced, uh, Bayer has purchased Monsanto, uh, uh, Chem China purchased Syngenta, uh, DuPont has merged with Dow Chemicals. So uh, there's there's even less companies controlling the, the seeds that are out there. These are all chemical companies. Most of the seeds that they control and are mostly interested in are genetically modified seeds that have been modified to withstand the chemicals that they sell that you can spray on the seed. So um, really, although they, they, you know, hold a lot of the world's seed commodities, they don't hold the, a lot of the world's varieties. Um, and those varieties and the heirloom varieties and the diversity we have in our backyards, it's not that these companies don't want them. They very much do want to have access to them. Um, they just don't want to maintain those varieties and sell them. Um, but they definitely want access to the wide breadth of genetics that those varieties uh, have. So why would you save seeds? Um, you know, just just uh, here's here's a couple different examples of why you might want to do that. Um, they will increase self sufficiency. You don't have to rely on companies uh, to produce your seed. Um, often people say, "Oh, seeds are expensive. They'll save me money." And I just I caution you uh, to make that claim unless you unless you're not counting the time it takes you to produce the seeds in in your backyard. Um, you're not, you're probably not saving money. Um, seed savers are really good at it. Uh, just as growing food in your backyard, if you count the time it takes for you to grow the food, you're not, probably you're not saving money over going to the grocery store. Um, but there's so many more benefits, uh, other than, um, just financial. Uh, if you get really good at it, absolutely, you can save money. But I don't think that's the main reason to be able to do it. Um, when COVID hit, and seed companies saw between a 300 to 3,000% increase in orders, uh, a lot of backyard gardeners had a hard time accessing seeds. So in those types of situations, it doesn't matter um, how much they cost, you actually can't get a hold of them. So having seeds that you produce yourself or that your community collectively holds and uh, stewards um, it, you know, it really mitigates those um, supply chain issues that uh, I'm sure we will see happen again in the future. Um, it ensures more diversity of agricultural crops. Again, the more of us that save seed, the more diversity there is out there. Um, you can grow seeds for your personal preference. So I'll get into seed breeding later, and I encourage people to think of themselves always as a seed breeder um, rather than just a seed saver. You don't need a PhD to do this. Uh, all it means is that you're letting seeds go through their full life cycle in your garden, and you're choosing the the crop and the, and the plants that you want to take forward into the next uh, generation. So um, a lot of breeders out there are breeding for certain characteristics of plants. For example, you want a tomato that you can harvest early that you can pack in a box, that you can ship 5,000 kilometers, and that will still look red when it's on the shelf. It doesn't really matter if it tastes good or if it has a lot of nutrition or if the acidity level is high enough to can without any of, uh, you know, botulism. Um, you, you, may wanna, you may wanna actually breed your own variety of tomato that's better for canning, that tastes better, that has more nutrition, um, and nobody else is doing that for you. Um, so I, I'd encourage that. Uh, when you grow seeds in your own backyard, your plants are adapting to your local environment, not just the temperature uh, and the climate, which these days is getting you know so unpredictable. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a way to breed for that, but it's adapting to your soil organisms, to your pests, to the diseases in your garden. It's building up resistance to those types of things that happen to be around a lot. Um, if there's no club root in a garden out in um, down in the southern states and they're growing brassica seeds, uh, those seeds aren't very resistant to club root. If I have a field full of club root and I'm trying to produce brassica seeds or broccoli seeds, 
uh, half of those plants are going to die and I'm going to save the ones that are more resistant and year after year I'll end up with uh, more resistant plants. Um, they increase uh, pollinator habitat. So again, when we talk about diversifying your gardenscape, uh, when you grow a carrot, it produces food for you uh, when you pull it out that first year and you eat it or you store it in your cooler and eat it. If you take that same root and replant it the following year, it produces a ton of nectar and a ton of pollen for all the insects around. Those insects in turn provide food for bird populations um, and you really feed the entire um, environment. You can even eat the bottom half of your carrot and still plant the top and make seeds. Um, I might talk about a bit later why carrots might not be the ideal crop for you to produce for seed on an ongoing basis in your garden, but to allow a few of them to go to flower, um, absolutely it can be very beneficial and they're beautiful. They make great cut flowers also. Um, <clears throat> As well, they increase community co co collaboration. So uh, I've always enjoyed garden communities, um, community garden. There's such an amazing community that comes around growing your own food. Uh, when you start to get into seed saving, it just, uh, you know, the, the level of self-sufficiency one feels when you buy seeds from a store and you plant it and you grow your own food that year and you eat your food, it's amazing. Um, the level of self-sufficiency you, you feel when you save your seed and you plant your seed and you eat the food and you save more seeds and you are able to perpetuate that cycle ongoing um, is, is really the, it's a, it's a much more, uh, it's even more feeling of self-sustainability. Um, and that type of work is always done in collaboration with others. It's, it would be very hard to be, uh, to, to do good seed saving and stewardship alone. Um, it takes a community to do that um, because there's a lot more varieties than one person is ever going to be able to produce in their lifetime. Um, and I think this is what we uh, we want to have. Um, I, I encourage you if you I can't see the chat, actually, so I didn't see where what people if they have um, comments. But if you uh, have any clarifying questions during uh, this presentation, feel free to put it in the Q&A. Um, and uh, um, I can be interrupted to answer them. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about seed stewardship. So there's two types of seed saving. There's uh, in situ saving, which literally means in right in the garden. In this, in that situation, the the seeds are growing. They're they're being produced. These are seeds so fresh that they're not even ready to plant yet. Um, of course, a crop failure could happen. So while they're growing in the garden, it's really nice to have them backed up in an ex situ situation. So as soon as you harvest your seed in the fall and you dry them and you take, you know, you preserve them well and you put them in storage, you are now storing them in an ex situ situation. Um, so they're protected so that you can plant them in future years. Um, seeds don't last forever. So uh, on the shelf, you know, in the picture on the right hand side there, um, some of those seeds may uh, be on the shelf, maybe those are two years old, some of them may be 20 years old, and the germination is dropping, and you're not going to be able to grow them out indefinitely. So the best type of seed conservation, in my opinion, is one that moves between these two types of seed preservation as quickly as possible. So you go from in situ to ex situ very quickly. Um, seed libraries, um, and I was asking Kendra about uh, seed libraries just before this conversation and if the West Vancouver had one, and hopefully one day you will, there isn't one there right now, but uh, this, is, this is sort of a fairly grand goal of a seed library, um, which is to, protect the genetic diversity in our food system and promote public access to seeds. Uh, initially, seeds are donated and collected at each library, and then the community members can check seeds out and grow them on the condition that a portion of the freshly grown seeds will be donated back to the library. Uh, these seeds are then stored and made available to others who continue to contribute to the cycle of taking seeds, growing them, and donating a portion back to keep the collection viable and healthy. Um, that said, there's lots of different models of seed libraries. Some of them uh, 
produce seed and have access to seeds just so people can try to grow the seeds out. Uh, they're encouraged to return them, but they don't have to return them. Um, clearly, it's much easier to return a book that you sign out from a library than a seed. You, you don't plant and water your book and hope it comes up and makes a crop the next year. It's pretty easy to preserve your book and make sure you return it on time. Um, so, of course, you're not you're you're obligated to try to return seeds, but you nobody's ever obligated to return seeds because crop failures happen all the time. Um, and what makes these sustainable is that in any given year, you might have 10 people growing out a crop. And if even half of them have crop failures, you still have the other half that are able to um, bring seeds back to the library. Um, now, again, this is the, ide the ideal um, type of uh, seed library uh, or seed stewardship, I'd say, like the goal of seed stewardship is uh, the goal of the, it's the process of saving seeds with the purpose of maintaining or improving that variety's health and resilience over time. Um, it's about saving a variety over a long period, many seasons, with the end goal of continually passing it on um, to others. So quite a grand, uh, a grand goal and uh, really one that I think we should um, try to achieve. So in order to um, produce seeds, uh, we need to actually understand how to produce seeds. And often this is the challenge with seed libraries. Um, Farm Folk City Folk ran a seed library capacity building project um, last year. We started it um, and it continues. And it started because we had a lot of people just towards the end of COVID reaching out saying, our community needs help with their seed library, or we would like to start a seed library. and um, we realized there's a ton of them. Um, there's, I th think there's probably over 60 seed libraries across British Columbia on our website um, at farmfolkcityfolk.ca. Uh, you can see a map of, I think we have, uh, we're in contact with about 40 of these libraries. Um, and so we've been working with them to try to um, uh, just sort of boost everybody's capacity to uh, do this work better. The challenge with most of the libraries, as you can imagine, is it's easy to sign out the seeds, but they don't get a whole lot of returns or they don't get as many returns as they um, wish they did. And part of this is that I don't think in our communities we have the appropriate level and amount of knowledge and experience in saving seeds. So the other, the other reason for these libraries, I mean, libraries are a hub of education and they're about uh, a place where people can go and learn how to save seeds um from by saving them from books um, and just being part of that community so i'm going to go through a little bit about the what type of knowledge you need in order to save seeds um, and what i'll say is uh, right off the bat it might sound sound complicated sometimes but you actually don't need any knowledge to let seeds to let your vegetables go to seed um, all of us can let some vegetables flower and in turn save seeds uh, if you want to do it for the purpose of creating a new variety or maintaining a variety, you need to actually understand what you're doing because you're not going to be able to uh, do it just by letting things flower and go to seed. So one of the first things you have to learn and, and be able to identify is um, a species. What is what is a species? So a species is a group of organisms that are similar enough that they can exchange genes and interbreed with one another. Um, so... As an example, uh, here's a, a, a picture of one species of plant, Brassica oleracea. It all came originally from a wild mustard plant. Um, and the types of foods we eat are Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi. These are all the same species. So if you wanna save a broccoli seed and cauliflower seed in the same year in your in your garden and you let them flower at the same time, you're not gonna save either of those. You're gonna make something new. You're gonna create a, a broccoli flower. Um, and um, and that might be fun, but you if you if what you wanna do is just save broccoli, you need to know that these two, uh, two plants are actually the uh, same species. So a cultivar is a cultivated variety is what, what that means. 
Um, so here's a picture of three different radicchio varieties. These are all the same species again. So if I like the Castle Frankel variety on the right-hand side, the one that's got speckled and it's uh, green and, and red speckled, um, it's a very long season radicchio, takes a long time to mature, but it's say it's it lives fairly well right through the winter in your garden, can be harvested, um, you know, even in December, January. Uh, sometimes they'll make it right through the whole winter. Um, if you want to maintain that variety, you need to make sure you're not letting it flower at the same time as the Treviso variety in the middle, which is a lot less winter hardy and it doesn't have the same appearance and look. Um, the people who develop these varieties individually spent years and years uh, separating out certain characteristics and selecting for certain characteristics. And if you want to maintain them, you need to make sure that you uh, understand what they can cross with in your in your garden. <clears throat> um, so types of cultivars. Um, I'm going to talk about three of them. One of them is the heirlooms. We often hear about heirloom plants. Uh, these are open pollinated uh, cultivars, and I'll explain what open pollinated is in a second. Uh, they typically have really good flavor, nutritional value. Uh, they have really good stories that come with the seeds. Um, they usually you know, have been handed down over the years, um, and there's often a story that goes along with them. Uh, I think in order to be an heirloom, they need to be identified from a seed catalog or some identification that they've been grown as that variety for at least 50 years. Uh, there's no official designation within our uh, Canada seed regulations of an heirloom, um, but that's typically how they're understood. Um, an open pollinated variety is uh, so all heirlooms are open pollinated, but you can create a new open pollinated variety that's only a couple years old. Um, an open pollinated variety is produced through usually the uninhibited transfer of pollen uh, between the members of the species, so the plants in the garden. So you're not walking out there and hand pollinating just certain individuals, you're letting them freely cross. Uh, in developing the variety, maybe somebody has done some hand pollination or they've started very specifically crossing two known varieties uh, but with the goal of producing an open pollinated variety an open pollinated variety can be saved and you can replant it and it will look the same as um, uh, the the plant that you saved it from it's kind of funny that i have this example here of an open pollinated variety this is actually um, a a, a cross between a Brussels sprout and kales um, that I started in 2004. So we're talking about an 18 year breeding project. Um, it's uh, I'm the goal is to create an open pollinated variety, um, but there's a lot of hybridizing that has happened in the, the, the process. And so saving the seeds from this plant and replanting it out, you may not get a plant that looks exactly like that, but maybe something like it. Um, and in order to explain that, I can I talk a little bit about hybrid cultivars. And I noticed there was a question in the uh, in the chat there. Um, somebody saved sun gold tomatoes, and they saved them and replanted them, but they don't taste like the originals. And uh, yes, that's absolutely true of sun gold tomatoes. A lot of hybrid tomatoes or ones listed as hybrids actually aren't hybrids. Um, and you would be able to save them and reproduce them. Sun golds, however, um, are a very complicated hybrid who that that actually have four parental lines maintained that produce or grand parental lines that produce two parental lines that then produce um, the sun gold tomato that is so popular. Uh, it's a delicious tomato. It's incredibly productive. Um, and yes, if you save seeds from it and replant it, unfortunately, you don't get the same uh, tomato that you save seeds from. And the reason for this um, in this in this diagram here, the example I use is corn, because there's been a huge amount of hybrid work done in corn. Almost all of the resources over the last 150 years in plant breeding has gone into hybrid plant breeding. Uh, there's lots of reasons for this. Um, and most of it has to do with um, the, the fact that a hybrid seed is much easier to commodify, it's easier to own, and it works really well in large-scale industrial agriculture type systems. 
So in order to produce a hybrid variety, um, often in seed catalogs, you'll see that listed as F1 variety, you need to create two inbred parent lines. And when I say inbred, I mean, it, it, it uh, carries that same sort of negative connotation. Inbred is, it's not a desirable trait. Uh, it's hard to maintain inbred parents. It's not something you want to strive for in an open pollinated population by any means. Um, however, if you create a, you know, usually you're creating hundreds or thousands of parental lines, parent one and parent two, uh, you're crossing them together, and then you're seeing what the offspring looks like. And if you have a really vigorous, great offspring, um, then you go ahead and you try to maintain those two parental lines so that you can produce the hybrid seed. When you save seeds from the F1, however, and you replant them out, um, the, the genetics revert back to one of the two parents or something in between. So in the case of sun gold tomatoes, there's actually like a grandparent one and a grandparent two that produce parent one. And then there's a grandparent one and grandparent two that produce parent two. And then those two are crossed together. And um, guess who has access to those parental lines and the grandparent lines? Not you. Um, so uh, sun gold was purchased by Monsanto years ago. So I assume the patent is now held with Bayer. Um, so they are the only ones that can produce that seed. Um, they are the ones, the only ones that have uh, the ability to produce the seed because they're not sharing the parents with anybody else. Um, that said, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't save seeds from a hybrid variety. Um, so when you save seeds from a hybrid variety, just as uh, uh, Alma did when she saved her sun gold, sun gold cherry tomatoes, um, they didn't taste like the original ones. But if you save a lot of them and you plant lots out, some of them might be quite similar to the original ones. And there's a couple different cherry tomato varieties out there that are now open pollinated. Uh, one of them is called Soleil cherry tomato, and this was produced by dehybridizing sun gold tomatoes. Uh, we've trialed them in vegetable and variety trials together. They don't quite stand up to the same level of productivity as a sun gold does, um, but they're pretty close and the flavor is quite close and you can save the seeds from them. And if you buy the seeds, they're gonna cost you about a 10th of the price that sun gold tomatoes would cost you. Um, so there's definitely benefits to them. Soleil is spelled uh, like uh, the sun S in French, S-O-L-I-E-L -E um, is how you spell soleil tomato. And there's a few others out there. Um, you you know you might even try to do a Google search for dehybridized sun gold tomatoes, um, and I encourage you to actually just take it on and do your own sun gold tomato dehybridizing. Uh, I did this years ago, and rather than selecting a tomato that looked like the sun gold, uh, there were a lot of really interesting uh, types of tomatoes that came out of the dehybridized sun gold. I found there were some really interesting elongated ones, some with uh, that were more green, some that were more pink. Um, so there's a lot of diversity often in these hybrids uh, that can be used in other kind of um, breeding work. Um, so you also need to understand how seeds are created or how pollen is moved around. Um, so there's certain types of plants that are self-pollinating, which means they have both the, uh, the part of the flower that produces pollen and the part that receives pollen in the same flower. And often these plants, as they open up, they pollinate themselves. So by the time a tomato flower has opened, for the most part, it's already pollinated itself. Some of the older heirloom varieties of tomatoes do this a bit slower um, and do cross with one another more often. But if you grow 10 different types of tomatoes right beside one another, and then you save the seed and you plant them out, you're probably only going to get maybe 5% of those actually crossing with one another. Um, but there may be some crossing will happen. Um, the other types of, uh, so the, the, I, I encourage you also to look at the flowers in your garden, not just look at, I think we're used to looking at flowers from afar, um, smelling them about how, you know, how, how beautiful they smell and what they look like, but look at the parts of the flower because the parts of the flower actually tell you a lot about um, how that flower can reproduce. 
So here, um, I'm not exactly sure what this is. Maybe it's a nasturtium, um, but it's a it's a flower that has both the male producing the the pollen producing parts, which are the red anthers, and then the um, the pollen receiving parts is the middle part. Um, again, on the same flower, uh, it doesn't mean that it necessarily will pollinate itself. Um, some varieties actually have a chemical mechanism where they can't accept pollen from themselves. Um, in this case, this flower to me looks like one that probably does um, do that and it can self-pollinate, but it could also be cross-pollinated. Cross-pollinated flowers, like I say, some of them have mechanisms to make sure that they don't self-pollinate. Um, and these types of plants, uh, genetically, normally you need a, a much higher population of those plants in order to do a good job of seed saving from them because they require a higher population and more plants crossing to maintain good genetic diversity um, ongoing. Um, and then there's imperfect flowers. If uh, any of you have seen squash flowers, um, you'll, you'll notice they don't look the same even on the same plant. So one plant will have uh, parts of the flower. The one on the left is the part that receives the pollen or sometimes referred to as female. And the part on the right is the part that produces the pollen or sometimes referred to as male. Um, and these, these plants, uh, the, these can be on the same plant. So the same plant can be pollinated by itself, but they often will come from different plants. Having those two flower parts on separate flowers really increases the chance of cross-pollination from other plants. So just sort of good to sort of understand and know whether your plants want a higher population or less. Um, most of the plants we have are monaceous, which means that they do have both the pollen receiving and pollen uh, um, giving organs on the same plant, not necessarily within the same flower. So in this picture, uh, the tomatoes in the middle and peppers in the middle, those have perfect flowers. So they have both parts on one flower. Um, corn actually has two flower types. One of them are, are the, the top, the anthers that if you know when it's when the corn is pollinating and you shake the top, you see pollen fall down and that falls down onto um, the other part of the flower is the corn itself. So those little, the silks that stick out of the corn, each one of those silks has a, a kernel of pollen land on it and the pollen travels down the silk and is, that's what actually produces the kernel. So um, for every silk that gets pollinated, you have a pollinated kernel. So if you've harvested corn that only has a, you know, half of the, the kernels uh, have matured, it's because there hasn't been enough pollination happening um, and not all the silks got pollinated. Uh, much less common are dioecious plants in our garden. So spinach being one of them, uh, there's often, there's some flowers and trees that are dioecious, honey locust trees, uh, white campion flowers, maybe rose campion flowers, uh, cannabis, these are some of the few plants that actually have separate uh, pollen receiving plants and pollen accepting plants. So if you plant a uh, hundred spinach out, only half of those, and you're trying to make seeds, um, you're only going to collect seeds from half of the plants. The other half are the ones that created the pollen for the seeds. You obviously need both types of plants to make seed, but they, uh, they don't happen on the same plant, uh, or at least they don't usually happen on the same plant. Um, plants are incredibly resilient. So if they, um, if a, if a dioecious plant is actually in an environment where there is not enough pollen and it is a pollen receiving or female plant, uh, it will trigger itself to create a hermaphroditic flower so that it can actually reproduce seed, um, but very rare and not the normal way that the seeds are reproduced. The other thing to understand when saving seeds, because it's a little bit different than um, when you're growing your garden, is just the life cycle of your plants. So uh, annuals are plants that you'll plant the seed this year and you'll save seeds from it this year. Biennials take two seasons and they often require a period of vernalization. So, uh, you know, um, carrots, beets, uh, uh, onions, um, some types of radish, most types of turnips will require... Uh, a period of cold that will trigger them into their next stage of life. So 
Um, often I've done seed saving workshops and I start talking about flowers and people ask where, where are the carrot flowers? Because most people don't get to see carrot flowers because you harvest them and eat them. Um, similarly with beet flowers, you don't usually leave the beets in the ground over winter um, and they don't, they don't produce seed. Um, but if you do, um, then you'll, you'll see those, those flowers will produce seed. Um, and then there's perennials that, that have a different life cycle than two years. Some produce flowers, uh, seeds every year, but they live for multiple years. Um, some people, some of them produce uh, seeds on a less often basis. I believe um, bamboo produces seed every seven years or so. Um, so where to start? in your seed saving journey. And uh, again, I encourage you to start just by doing it. Um, uh, don't become an expert before you save seeds. The birds, the bees will love you for it. Um, just let some things go to flower. Um, but if what you're looking to do is plan your garden, then these are some of the things you need to think through. You need to think of uh, which variety or cultivar you're growing in your, your garden. Um, if you wanna produce a, a good tasting watermelon um, for your garden, maybe don't go to the grocery store and get seeds out of a watermelon. You have no idea how those are produced. They could be hybrids. They could be grown somewhere that's very different than your climate. So know the variety. Um, if I wanted a, a watermelon, I would look for one that does well in cool seasons because we don't have the type of heat that uh, that most watermelon producing areas have. Um, I would look for something that uh, could be produced in a short season as well, because I'd like to harvest them before they get, to, you know, we get our wet rainy season. So I would look specifically for those varieties um, in seed catalogs and through exchanges like the Seed Savers Exchange or Seeds of Diversity Canada or seed libraries or CD Saturday events. Um, ideally you get them from the person who grow, grew them, who can tell you about the seeds, but, um, or a seed catalog that has a good, uh, explanation of how they were grown or where they came from. Um, so once you decide which varieties and cultivars you're growing, you need to, uh, understand your isolation distances. So if you, what you want to do is cross two varieties, you need to know how close they need to be together to do that. Uh, and if you don't want to cross those varieties, you need to understand how far apart they need to do be um, to do that. And there's some a chart that I'll share with you at the end um, that has lots of this information. And it's really as simple as decide what plant you want to save seed from and do a little bit of a Google search on it. Um, and I'll provide some resources for that to, to get this type of information. Uh, things also like population size. Um, plants like beans and peas and tomatoes. Uh, as a backyard gardener, if you grow just a few plants, you can save seeds from those varieties. Um, you can do that year after year and still maintain a really good, robust variety. Um, if you try to do that with something like carrots that really prefer outcrossing and you save seeds, so I would encourage you to plant a few carrots in your garden just to let them make flowers. Um, but I don't know that I'd encourage you to save the seeds and pass those on as a variety uh, that you encourage people to steward into the future. The reason being carrots require a population size of probably one or 200 carrots in order to maintain good genetics to, to you know, carry that variety forward. Um, that again is for an established variety. So if I'm growing you know, a Nash's Nance carrot, and I want to maintain that as a Nash's Nance, then I need to grow lots of those carrots out. Uh, if I'm creating a new variety of carrot and I take a Nash's Nance and cross it with a purple dragon, um, there's so much diversity in those two crosses. I can do it with a very small population uh, at first. And then once you get into more a uniform uh, population or variety, uh, then you need more of a population size. So not necessarily the thing that's going to be easiest to do in a, a small garden patch, but definitely the, the type of thing that a community garden could come together and if they, what they wanted to do was produce uh, carrot seeds for everybody for the next two years, uh, you could designate one patch to grow 200 or 100 carrots in, um, save seeds, and then um, those would be seeds for everybody. Um, so it could be, it can be done as a community, but harder in a small garden. And then the other thing to keep in mind, I'll talk about in a bit is um, seed maturity, because growing seeds 
uh, for to the food stage and the seed stage are very different. Um, so again, learn about the scientific name, um, learn about the potential for those to cross pollinate, understand if your crop's monaceous or dioecious. Uh, if it's dioecious, you obviously need at least two plants to produce seed. Um, and here again, it says, make sure your seeds are open pollinated, not a hybrid, but um, depending on what you wanna do, you can use hybrid varieties as well. Um, so you need to think about isolation distance. This is an overhead shot of um, a Farm Folk City Folk runs a research and education seed farm out in Abbotsford. Uh, this is a three acre site, but you'll notice our fields are fairly uh, separated um, um, by certain distances. And this is so we can grow uh, the same, um, same crop, different varieties in the same field in the same year. Uh, so for example, uh, the, the triangle on the bottom and the triangle in the middle, um, that those two fields are about 70 feet away. Um, and I can fairly safely grow two pepper plants, one in one field, one in the other, and have them not cross with one another. Um, if I was to grow two broccoli varieties, that's going to be much too close, or two squash varieties that are in the same category. So a pumpkin and a zucchini will cross with one another. Um, that would be too close. Um, however, uh, from that middle triangle to the other one, you'll notice there's a, a forest in between. There's a big gully uh, in the summer when the uh, flowers are pollinating and the, the pollinators are flying. Um, that, that forest is quite full and lush, and that might be enough of a barrier to prevent the cross-pollination. Um, so there's, a, the, you know, that's, there's distance, but there's also barriers that you have to take into consideration. If I was to sell seeds... Uh, be selling seeds, I would really want to make sure they haven't crossed with one another. Um, so as a producer in this field, um, if I was trying to produce a zucchini and a, and a, a pumpkin in the same year, I would definitely want to isolate them, but then I would want to try them out, grow them out, make sure they didn't cross before I offered them to others, um, just because the distance is fairly close. And if I don't have experience in my field, um, then it's hard to know. Um, after years of growing in the same place, you 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 tend to understand the flow of pollinators, and if you you know do it long enough, you know um, that some of your isolation distances can be uh, minimized by quite a bit. <clears throat> so again, uh, just talking about population size, you need to maintain a certain uh, size of population to uh, continue good genetics over the long period. Um, there's a difference between like good enough genetics and preserving for commercial use. Uh, there's a difference between a population size of a variety that's quite diverse and one that's quite uniform. Um, so the more uniformity, um, the the less, uh, the higher population you usually need. Um, somebody's asking how feasible is seed saving in my uh, apartment uh, balcony garden? So uh, carrots, corn, probably not. Um, tomatoes, absolutely. Um, I work with an organization, a company called um, BC Ecoseed Co-op. Um, and we had one of our members uh, actually uh, was moving gardens and decided he was just wanted to grow a crop one year and he grew a commercial tomato crop on his balcony. You know, his balcony was staffed with only one variety of tomatoes because he was trying to produce a fair amount, but um, he had sort of 20 tomato plants, which is enough of a population to save seed from um, even commercially on his balcony and was able to do a seed crop from it. So certain crops, absolutely. I, I grew um, sugar snap peas on my uh, balcony garden last year. Um, I live on a farm, but I do have a balcony garden as well. And um, I ate, you know, 80% uh, of those peas and I left some to dry. And so I replanted them this year. So you can definitely save seeds in a small space. Um, you just have to understand what type of seeds will do well in that uh, space. And then you need to think about the time of harvest or the maturity of your seeds. So, uh, you know, for example, a carrot seed it takes two years to produce so it's a take twice as long to produce a carrot as it does to produce or twice as long to produce carrot seed as it does to produce a carrot. Uh, cucumbers, there's an example of cucumbers. Um, 
when you harvest a cucumber to eat, the seeds are very small. You don't pick the seeds out while you're eating them, um, they're, but they're not mature enough to replant. So if you want to save cucumber seeds, you really need to let the cucumbers get uh, large and mushy and inedible so that the seeds themselves are mature. Um, so, and then the other thing is sometimes plants as they go to seed take up a lot more space. So a beet plant, when it grows, you can space beets, you know, four inches apart. Uh, when you're growing beets to seed, you, you want at least a foot, you could probably put them two feet apart and they would completely cover that, that garden space. So it does potentially require more space. Um, again, some types of seed crops, and like I say, seeds for your, your balcony, um, not only are the seeds mature at the same stage that you eat the food, but you can actually do both. So I always, when I save tomato seeds, I scoop the seeds out. Um, there's a process of fermentation that they go through and then drying, but I dry the rest of the tomato. Uh, so I get lots of food crop out of my seed crop. Same with uh, winter squash. Um, that's a crop that has seed mature at the same time as the food is mature so you, you can actually harvest and um, you know eat your food and save your seeds at the same time so once you save your seeds you want to get them ready for preserving these it's hard to see the scale of these uh this picture but um these are pickling cucumbers and they're probably about a foot long um, and, you know, pretty good diameter. They're soft and mushy inside. Um, this is the stage that they need to be at to save for seed. Um, but of course, inedible. Pickling cucumbers, um, thank goodness they produce so well. By the end of the season, I, I give up on harvesting them. So there's uh, still lots that go to seed. When you collect your seeds, you may need to just pay attention to the weather. Um, this is a picture of seeds drying under cover because in, in our climate, often the seeds we grow, they mature at the very end of the season, right when the rain is coming out. So if you have a lettuce plant that has mature seed on it, it's nice and dry, ready for harvesting. Uh, that's great, but all it takes is one day of rain to ruin all of your seeds. So at that late stage in the season, you want to be paying attention to the weather in your plants. If the seeds aren't mature yet, the rain can fall on it and they'll dry off and then they'll mature up. But if they're at that very mature stage, um, then the rain can ruin them. So if you see your lettuce are almost mature and the forecast is for two weeks of solid rain, um, what you want to do is actually pull those plants out of the ground with as much root on as you can and hang them somewhere inside to let them finish maturing. Um, often what I'll do is if I'm not sure if the weather is going to be favorable, I might do that with half my crop because it's a lot more work to do that than to save them out in the field and leave the other half. Um, and you're just sort of taking a chance or, or uh, another way to look at it is uh, providing yourself with some insurance that you'll at least get some seeds. So you do need to pay attention to that. Um, also some seeds as they mature will will fall out of a seed pod. Sometimes the seeds will pop open and fling out. Um, if anybody's tried to save borage seeds, they like the flowers turn downward and then they open up and drop on the ground before you can get them. So you do have to actually harvest them before they're fully ripe. You just pay attention to what happens to the seed at the end of the year um, uh, and uh, make sure you harvest them at the, at the right time. Ideally, when you harvest the seed, it's fully mature on the plant, um, and that's not always possible in our climate. So that's what we're aiming for, but not always possible. Um, seed cleaning, people ask me about cleaning, like, so do you use uh, bleach or peroxide? How do you get them? Do you shine them up? Um, seed cleaning is really just the process of separating the seeds out from the rest of the plant matter. So when you grow um, a plant to seed, the seeds are usually contained within some kind of pod or fruit, and you need to break the pot open, get the seeds out. So that's the process of threshing. Um, then you need to winnow them and separate the seeds from the chaff. And that can be do, done through either winnowing, which is you know blowing a, a current of air across the seeds so that the lighter stuff gets blown away and the heavier stuff falls. Um, or you can use screens to shake them through screens. So either separating by weight or by size. And there's a lot of high-tech ways to do it. 
Um, I find a stainless steel bowl in my breath is enough to do some air separation of most seeds. Um, it's usually important to dry your seeds. And when I say dry them, I mean dry, 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 dry them. And when you think they're dry enough, dry them some more and make sure that they're really, really dry. Um, because if you take a seed that's not fully dry and you stick it in your seed storage, especially a plastic bag, it's going to mold. Um, and our climate at the time of year that it's um, that seeds are drying, it's it's quite moist out. So if you if you're drying your seeds in an outdoor shed, for example, um, in October in our climate, it's they're never going to dry dry enough for you to store them in a jar. You need to bring those seeds inside and get them in a very dry environment before you stick them in a container. Um, Storage is just ideally you want a consistent temperature, low humidity, low temperature, um, and not a lot of fluctuation. So, you know, there's there's um, types of seed storage that is like regulated, temperature controlled. You might have a dehumidifier and an air conditioner in the summer. And, you know, if you want ideal conditions, um, if people have heard of the Svalbard Seed Bank in Norway, this is like a long-term seed storage, um, you know, that they have seeds in the uh, buried deep in the side of a, a mountain. Um, and that's a very regulated, controlled environment. They're trying to keep seeds for 50 years. Um, keep in mind when you pull those 50-year-old seeds out and you plant them in the environment that they haven't evolved with, um, they're going to be quite challenged. Um, however, it's really not necessary. If you're not storing your seeds for a long period of time, um, then uh, you really don't need that type of storage. Um, you just need something, like I say, cool, dry, and consistent. So <clears throat> if you have a dry basement, just find basically the coolest, driest part of your house out of the sun, and that's where you store your seeds. Um, um, And here's some here's some resources. I'm happy to um, maybe we can I can throw some links in the chat later. Uh, seed Savers Exchange has a seed saving guide, which I'm actually going to show a picture of as well. Um, Seeds of Diversity Canada, just Google them, look them up. Uh, it's a great organization. I don't even think you have to pay for membership anymore, but I do encourage um, everybody to become a member of it. Uh, like I say, they have like you can have access to. 400 different varieties of tomatoes. They're not a seed company, so it's a membership-based organization. Um, they do run a couple seed bank programs and seed growouts, but uh, basically when you sign up to be a member, um, you can go into the member directory, uh, you look for the varieties of seeds, You it identifies the person who grew them and their contact information, and you actually order seeds directly from the person who grew them. It's not um, it's not through a seed company or anything. So you have direct contact to the person who grew them the previous year or whenever they did. Um, Organic Seed Alliance uh, is an, an, a wonderful organization just south of the border. Um, and they've got uh, lots of resources on their website. And Johnny Seeds has some great guides to seed storage um, on their website. Um, this is a picture of that seed saving guide. Um, and, you know, so I'll just, uh, you know, share that they, this has a huge amount of information. This is just one page of the guide, but it goes through most of the types of vegetable crops you're going to grow. It identifies the species name, the family that it's in, uh, the life cycle, whether it's perennial, the type of pollination that uh, needs to happen, the recommended isolation distance. And then they even have population size for like, uh, maintaining the variety or preserving it like for genetic preservation. Um, I would say that a lot of these numbers uh, are even higher maybe than they need to be uh, for your home garden. Um, but again, this is something to sort of uh, try to like uh, achieve if we can. Um, and as a seed producer, I would definitely want to grow a much higher population size um, of those. So I think that's the end of this presentation. Um, thank you so much for your um, for listening. And I guess we can open it up to the chat. I'll just stop sharing my screen. 
Yep. So we do have some questions. Um, mm. First question, will storing seeds in the freezer prolong their life by a few years? Any precaution when taking them out and planting them? Yeah, so you you can definitely get um, longer storage in the freezer. Uh, at the farm I work at, we in the past used to store all our seeds in the freezer um, until one day somebody accidentally walked past the freezer and kicked the plug out. So the the freezer will store your seeds for uh, you know a longer period of time, um, but uh, if if you have a power failure, they're unplugged. You really need to get them out and have them dry because an unplugged freezer becomes moist very quickly. Um, so yeah, if you often what I'll do with breeding projects. So like I, I showed an example of that uh, cross between a kale and Brussels sprouts that I started many years ago. I have some of the you know the varieties that I saved from 2010 in a freezer just in case I want to go back to. Uh, one of the old parent parent lines of that and uh, reintroduce them. Um, but for the most part, I just try to grow them out as often as possible. Okay. Um, and folks, if you do have questions, you can put them in the Q&A or the chat. I will um, find them in both places. Um, all right. So how fast will seeds adapt to their environment? For example, seeds saved from plants that survived last year's very wet, cold spring. Will they mm. be more resilient to the cold and wet? It's a really interesting question these days because our climate is so uh, inconsistent um, that we might want a variety really well adapted to a hot desert climate depending on the year. Um, so what I will say is like some of the some of the breeding we've we've done some collaborative breeding work uh, through Farm Folk City Folk and through an organization called the uh, Bauda Initiative on Canadian Seed Security, of which we're the provincial uh, uh, manager of that program. So there was some varieties. Uh, there was a, a project, a uh, participatory breeding project, where we had a professor through the out of the University of Manitoba, took some old wheat varieties and crossed them with modern wheat varieties, and then sent them out to farmers to select for them um, for for about, I think it took about six years of selection. And then those farmer selections were sent back and tested across Canada and across multiple um, uh, across multiple sites. Um, so I'm getting to why there's this relates to, <laughs> to local adaption. What they found was that they, some of the modern varieties, uh, they will always produce better if you have the perfect amount of fertility and the perfect amount of water and a really good season. Uh, in years where the fertility's off or the weather's off, those varieties actually won't produce that well. And what they found is some of the farmer produced varieties, again, they might not do as well as those varieties in a perfect year, but across multiple sites, they did better than those varieties on average. So they have flexible genetics within them. So it's not that like, so if this year we have a really, really wet spring and a wet cold summer, you're selecting the genetics in that variety um, to adapt to that type of climate. Uh, next year, you grow that same variety out and you're saving your seeds in a really dry, hot season. Um, some of those you're gonna save are gonna have genetics that do well in that environment. And as long, again, as if you have a large enough population and you do that type of seed saving over multiple years, you will, we will probably, and I don't know for sure, because I don't know if anybody understands the, you know, fully understands the genetics of this. And we certainly don't fully understand where our climate's going. Um, but we, I, I think that we're going to mitigate the potential, you know, challenges of having uh, less diversity within our seeds. So it's not so much flexible, like a, a adaptation to specific climate, I think of. It's more adaptation. It's a more creation of elastic populations that I think are really important for us when we think of local seed production. And the other thing is, if we have, if everybody, I don't know how many people are on this webinar, but if there's 60 of us and we all save uh, the same variety of something year after year, uh, after 10 or 20 uh, generations, and when I say generations, I mean plant generations, not humans, um, we will end up with a, a much higher diversity of plants. 
And some will be better in some climates, some will be better in others, some will have different resistance to different things. And so we're just increasing genetic diversity um, so that if one variety fails, we have some backups. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, how should commercial seed packets be stored at home? Uh, oh, when you when you buy them from... Mm -hmm. You could just buy a company. packet of seeds, I assume. Yeah, same, <laughs> same way as you'd store your own home uh, saved seeds, you know. So uh, a cool, a nice, cool, uh, dry environment. Uh, nowadays, you can get seeds pelletized for easier planting. I don't know if anybody usually... That's probably more something for farmers because they use the they use seeding machines um that definitely reduces the life of a seed um and i guess the other thing to keep in mind is when you buy seeds on a seed packet there's uh there's a depending on where you get it from there's not a lot of transparency about when that seed was produced so you, you might have a germination rate on it and it might be germinating at 90 percent, but the seed could still be five years old and so you're going to expect the germination to drop quite quickly. Um, so you don't really know how long you can save seeds purchased uh, from, you know, a grower, unless you're buying them from a grower that can tell you when they harvested them. Um, and the other part of that is that um, certain types of seeds have longer lifespans. So um, there are, there's definitely within those resources, uh, you, you can find that out, but things like uh, alliums, for example, carrots and parsnips, typically their germination rate drops fairly steadily uh, on average after just a couple years, whereas, you know, squash and brassica seeds um, can last, you know, 10 years and be absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, okay. So what is a good resource for manual cross-pollination, for example, using a Q-tip? Um, huh. A good resource for that i i would maybe look up some of the stuff through the organic seed alliance um they might have like crop specific uh uh breeding uh suggestions um i'd suggest depending on what the crop is um again this is why you just need to observe the flower because you really have to be able to do that process at at a very appropriate time at the right time mm -hmm. um Squash is one of those ones that backyard gardeners definitely uh, can do, and you don't actually need a Q-tip to do that. You can just uh, pinch the flower, the the, the pollen-producing part of the flower off and carry it to the female part or the pollen-receiving part. Um, yeah, so probably a Q-tip. Um, there's specialty tweezers out there that people use as well, like very, uh, I have a, a pair of them here. They're very, very, like... Uh, you know, uh, pointy tweezers. And so you can, you really need to be able to get out and pick that uh, pollen producing part of the flower out very carefully. Okay. All right. I have a heritage tomato that originally came from Italy, saved seeds and grown them out for at least a decade. And I often have surplus seeds. Is Seeds of Diversity Canada the kind of place that might accept surplus seeds or do you have other recommendations? Um, I'd be um, happy to take some of those seeds at the library. If you want to drop some off, we'll grow them on the library garden. <laughs> I was going to say, all it takes <laughs> is seeing something like that at a seed event or a CD Saturday or yeah. on a webinar like this. Um, and you <laughs> might have lots of people that will take you up on, uh, you know, taking that seed and helping you steward it into the future. If you have, if it's a great variety and you've been growing it this long, um, I suggest sharing it with others because one day you might have a crop failure um, and it's really great to know that some people, that other people are maintaining that for you. Um, the challenge the challenge with it, and yes, maybe Seeds of Diversity is a good place to, to send that seed. Um, the challenge often is, is do you, do you know the name of the variety of the seed? Is, is, is it um, often some of the old varieties of seeds came from different people? They might be the same variety more or less, but they um, have different names. So it might be hard to identify whether Seeds of Diversity already has that variety. Um, so if there is a variety name, I think the first thing to do is go and look it up on the Seeds of Diversity website. They actually have an excellent rename not known yet, then that's always uh, yeah. tricky. Um, if the, the, the name's not, so I'm actually working with a farmer this year um, 
who came to me and says, I've got this said, I've got this green bean in my family. It came from a relative in Russia 30 years ago, and we've grown it out for 30 years. And I don't know what it is, but I think it looks like a blue lake pole bean. So I have now five other farmers who are going to grow out this person's bean next to blue lake pole bean. And we're going to like you know take some data and try to identify whether it is or isn't. If it's not, then I might need to grow it next to Kentucky Wonder next year and a few other green pole beans that might look mm -hmm. like it to actually know if it's a different variety or something new. Um, it's possible it was Blue Lake, but over the years, over the last 30 years of saving it, it looks different now. So maybe it's a new variety. So if you don't know the name of the variety, um, I think the best thing to do is maybe look through like Seeds of Diversity Canada, look at... They list their tomato varieties by um, in different categories. So they'll have like, uh, you know, green tomatoes, purple tomatoes, orange, yellow, different colors, uh, cherry, cocktail size. So look for the category and try to find a tomato that describes the one you have um, and order some of those seeds and see if maybe if it's the same thing. And if not, you may just have something completely un unique and new. And um, if it's a really good variety and it does well here, it would be great to share it with others for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have a resource where you can see seed shape images and the seed producing part images? Um, see, you know, we actually have on our website, uh, farmfolkcityfolk.ca, there's, um, we did um, a seed stewardship education project last year in collaboration with the farm to school program. And we developed a few resources for teachers to use for their kids. One of those is um, it's a seed matching game. So it's a collection of, it's like a card deck that you can, you can download them and print them out yourself. Um, and it's a matching game. So the, the name of the vegetables on the back and the seeds are on the front, but it's, you have to match the flower with the plant, with the seed pod, with the dried seeds. So there are pictures of that. Um, other than that, I'd, yeah, I'd probably just uh, Google it. There's probably some other examples out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, do you recommend drying seeds and the whole plant in a paper bag? Um, sometimes I'll put a paper bag over the plant so to ca catch the seed, but um, ideally just in an open, very dry environment. I actually have a seed, what I call the seed cave here, and it's a room that has... Uh, an air conditioner and a dehumidifier in it, um, just because it is an outbuilding. Um, and I'll often hang the plant underneath something to catch the seed. Um, but yeah, like on, on a smaller scale, I've definitely seen people just put a bag around the plant. Um, make sure, of course, it's paper, not plastic. Mm -hmm. The plastic bag will just create moisture. Okay. Um. So for backyard gardeners and, you know, apartment gardeners and for people who this seed saving may seem like a really huge monumental scientific task. Um, what's just the easiest approach? Um, a small scale backyard gardener seed saving. So I heard a I heard a great um, Dan Brisbois from Turnisol Seeds. He uh, in Quebec he does some seed education stuff, um, and he had this great. This, this great way of describing how you learn how to grow seeds. So you can you can take all the information that I shared and you can research and Google it and you can make sure you don't let your seeds cross and you have a big enough population or you can just go and do it. You go save your seeds, plant them out the next year and see what happens to them. Um, in my experience, the, the plants that I grow have been as good if not better teachers than the people who've shared the information about uh, the plants that I've been growing for seeds. So I just really encourage people to try it, but practice uh, your observation skills. So like look for differences in varieties, look for differences in individual plants, like think about the qualities that you would like in a plant and how they're different um, when you do that. So when I save, when you save seeds from your tomatoes and plant it out, like that person mentioned, uh, it was obviously easy to observe in that, you know, saving the stun gold tomato that they were very different than the others. But if you save seeds from an open pollinated variety and you plant those out, um, observe the ones that are more robust, that are doing better and make sure that you, those are the ones you might want to carry forward. Um, but really just, just doing it, saving some seeds, 
Um, I often say there's a difference between there's seed saving and there's seed breeding. Uh, seed saving is when you don't plan on saving seeds, but at the end of the year, you walk past your garden and you go, oh, that one made seeds. I'm going to save the seeds from it. I don't even remember what plant it was. I think it's a brassica or something like that, or not think about what it's crossing with. And seed breeding is a lot more intentional. Um, but even if all you do is save seeds and replant it, the environment and the weather and the climate over time is going to breed, they're going to breed your seeds for you. Um, so I think we're always doing seed breeding. And I just, again, just encourage people to, to start. Okay. Um, so here's a question. How, what does copywriting a seed look like? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the copywriting a seed, those are more like patents and restrictions yeah. that people put on them. Um, I, 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 I work in a very uncomfortable environment, I think, where I work, uh, my work, I sometimes work with farmers who are in the world of trying to make a living and commodifying seeds. And I've had breeders share with me, you know, I'm a seed breeder. I breed new varieties. I'm not a farmer. So it takes me seven years to breed a new variety. I have to put a patent on it so I can recover all the work I've put in for the last seven years. And so it's hard to argue with that. However, I really do believe that seeds should be public domain open, you know, to everybody. Uh, what this seed breeder shared with me too is like patents last 20 years. I recover my money and then anybody can use it again afterwards. Um, it's a little different with genetically modified seeds, not that any of us want to reproduce those in our garden. They're not really bred for us. Um, so yeah, they're, they're usually, they're usually patents that are put on plants. It's usually hard to even see if a, a seed has been patented. Um, <clears throat> you won't get charged or put in jail for saving a patented <laughs> seed. Uh, if you grow a patented seed out and you start publicly selling it and that company catches wind of it they're probably going to reach out and tell you to stop and maybe press charges of some kind. Uh, often seeds are patented in one country and not the other. So lots of our vegetable varieties are patented in the United States, but not in Canada. So you could grow them out and sell them in Canada. However, if that company catches wind of it, they're going to put a patent on it in <laughs> Canada. If they did produce the variety and then yeah. they'll reach out and say, you've got to stop selling it. Um, for a backyard gardener, I just encourage you to use the genetics that you that is available out there um, and save what you can. Um, yeah. So if you're purchasing seeds, you know, I'm, I love getting seeds from West Coast Seeds, local seed company. How do you know, how do you ensure that you're getting seeds that are not genetically modified, that are not patented, that are kind of homegrown? Well, so I mean, farm West grown Coast, seeds. West Coast Seeds, um, they're fairly transparent about not selling any gen genetically modified seeds. Um, what they're not transparent about is where they get their seeds. And yeah. I, I do think a lot of people think that they're buying local seeds when they buy seeds from West Coast Seeds, but the West Coast Seeds really does not buy a lot of their seeds locally. Um, most seed companies of that size are, they're needing to, they're, they're, they're smart businesses and they need to make, uh, you, you want to make more income from, but from seed sales. Um, Local food is more expensive than food that's being produced far away, and so is local seed. Um, there's also less there's less local seeds being produced. But I, what I will say is that over the last decade, I have seen a huge increase in amazing local BC seed companies. We have uh, on our website um, under the the resource section of like where you can find seeds. We have a listing of BC seed companies. So these are people actually growing seeds in British Columbia. Um, and BC Eco Seed Co-op is a really good place to go as well. They are a collection of about 20 of those farms. Um, some of them sell seeds individually and some just uh, they're farmers that sell seeds through BC Eco Seed Co-op. But those are 20 farmers that sell seeds through the co-op and um, <clears throat> the transparency is there. So you go on the website and you can actually see which farm grew it. Um, and if you reached out, you could probably ask and find out when they were grown and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I definitely encourage us to, to, to try to find and support our local seed industry. Um, and, and again, you don't have to worry too much about genetically modified seeds. 
for the most part, they haven't really been bred for home garden use. There's not a lot of genetically modified vegetables that you would even be able to buy uh, for your garden. There, If you looked really hard, you might find a sweet corn. Um, but I, I think that's that's it. Yeah. Okay. Good resources. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for this. This has been really, really amazing and informational. And we will try and um, get the video up next week so everyone can can go back through all of this and um, we'll send out all the resources that you've sent um, as well from your website I know there's lots of great resources um, mm -hmm. the library's garden Switeway Tumewuk is in full bloom so I encourage folks to come by the library and and see all the amazing things happening in our garden um, I put it in the chat but North Vancouver City Library does have um, a really nice seed library they are um, the the primary one that I know of on the North Shore so if you're on the North Shore go check out the North Vancouver City Library seed library and um, David thank you so much this has been really wonderful yeah no problem thanks for inviting me yep have a wonderful day everyone hey, go save seeds everyone <laughs>